Hey everyone, Coach Patrick here, Endurance Nation, home to the world's largest, fastest online endurance team. Excited to talk to you today about Summertime Sadness, not just an amazing song by an amazing artist, but also a problem that most endurance athletes have when they get into the throes of the summer, the races are coming and they're struggling with the heat. And every year this comes up before you, whether or not you believe in global warming before that happened, but every year the intersection of fitness with the reality of the outdoors always brings friction to athletes. And for the majority of athletes, they take this as a sort of a blow to their sort of fitness ego. And they're also missing out on the opportunity here to actually do some good positive work. So one of the things that we try and do inside Endurance Nation is when athletes run into problems is that we reframe those problems as opportunities, okay? There's bad weather. You can't ride outside. You can ride inside. We can do better intervals inside, right? There's your travel plans got derailed. You can't do your training session, but like, what can you do instead? You can do all the stretching. You can do all this core work, right? Or something else, right? Just thinking about the athletic lens, but this also pertains to sort of anything in life. There's a huge chunk of our lives that we cannot control. And it really manifests itself in many different ways in our training. And for us as athletes, because it happens to our training, it seems like a greater sort of more outsized impact, right? So when our runs slow down, when our bikes get worse, when we feel we don't bounce back as much between sessions as we did just a month ago, people start to kind of get a little freaky deaky. They're like, wait a minute, life is something's not right. Like I, maybe I should go see my doctor. Like maybe something's not great. And of course you should always check with your physician. But when the summertime hits, this is the time when we have to put some new strategies in place to make sure that you can continue doing what you're doing before. Okay, so let's talk about the heat and the effects that it has on your training. And I'm only going to talk about the practical aspects out of it. I'm not going to get into the science or so on. But number one, the heat means that ultimately you're showing up in a dehydrated state. Just because life is hot, life is challenging, whether or not you have AC or not, you're just hotter, right? You're just, you're a hotter human being. So if you always showed up at 80% hydration or 85% hydration for whatever your session was, just understand that you're showing up at like 60% now. We just lost 10 or 20%. There's an adaptation period with the heat, you'll bounce back a little bit, but in general, it's going to be lower. So we have to account for that pre-dehydration and say, how do I do a better job of hydrating before I go? So for example, if you're bringing a bottle to the gym for your workout, but it's summertime, drink a bottle before you leave home and then bring the bottle to the gym, right? So we're filling ourselves with sports drink and electrolytes and nutrients and all the things that we need. And then we've got more for later as well. So we've actually got some inside of us and we've got some with us. Awesome, right? We solve for that problem. The second element of heat that makes life really challenging is that there's two types of heat. There's the there's the humidity, and then there's actually the direct heat, the direct sunlight. Both are effectively evil when you're an endurance athlete, but both are things you have to come to terms with, right? So on the humidity side, it makes those mornings, particularly where I live here in the Northeast, really challenging because the air is like heavy and sticky. The inside of your goggle, the glasses will fog up when you're riding or running, for example. It's just sticky and gross, right? And for athletes who are larger, myself included, you definitely start to feel that heat a little bit more. It's just hard. The moisture, normally when we sweat, it evaporates off of our skin. The evaporation is the cooling process. When moisture is in the air, the moisture doesn't want to leave your body. It just sits on your skin. It doesn't go anywhere. So you don't have that evaporation and cooling effect. You actually, you can actually wipe your arm if you're sweating. You can wipe your arm off and you'll feel cooler because you've gotten the moisture off your arm, like a, like a squeegee in a shower or something like that, right? And so dealing with that humidity is actually really challenging. So similarly, there's a bell curve in terms of how we deal with the heat and get through it. Even though the heat will be here to stay, you will adapt to it. So what I do recommend is if you are particularly affected by humidity is making sure that you really dial that expectation down for those sessions that are at peak humidity. You can always adjust to times of your day, theoretically, depending on where you are on the globe, to have less humidity, but that may mess up with your schedule. So at the end of the day, just understanding that. The other side of heat is a little bit more easier to address, which is that direct heat, direct sunlight. And in that case, you're going to be experiencing that on race day for sure, because it's summer wherever you're going to be racing, maybe a different type of heat and the humidity may be up or down, but there will be a point in time, hopefully not just rain, but there should be some sunshine and sun on the race, right? And so in this case, it's about wearing the right gear. It's about putting on sunscreen. 
I went out for a nice long ride today. You can see a sunscreen, not so much. And so definitely want to do a better job with that, taking care of your body. In my case, it was a six hour ride. Probably should have brought some sunscreen because it probably was gone after three hours, right? But that sun wasn't going anywhere. So doing a good job with skincare makes a big difference for you as well. And then also when you're working out, going back to my first concept for you, is understanding on the hydration side that if we say we're going to drink a bottle an hour, let me go left to right here in terms of time at the bottom axis was time here. That first hour bottle is super critical, right? Because hour five is predicated on you having had four bottles by the time you get to hour five. If you kind of space on number one and you maybe have one bottle for an hour and a half and so on, then all of a sudden you show up with like half or a bottle less by the time you get to hour four, now you're in trouble. And it's been a slow boiling frog type trouble where you don't actually notice what's going on. So in those hotter workout days, Hour one hydration really matters. So does prehydration days, but hour one hydration really matters. So getting that right. And even if you're doing a short workout, so you're just running for or riding for an hour or less than an hour, you still want to hydrate during that session. A, because you can practice hydrating, gets you better at it, better consuming the fluids you need on race day. But it also offsets some of the cost of that session later. If you do it, you're like, ah, it's only an hour, you know, 45 minutes run. You lose like a pound of fluids. You go back to work. You're out of it. You just don't feel good. And the hydration options available to you at the office, not quite the same as they are at home. You've got like crappy coffee or water from like the bathroom faucet or the sink that neither one of those are great for you. And at the end of the day, you're going to be in a worse place. So really prioritizing that hydration really makes a big difference in that first hour of that session. In some cases, I may even cheat up, right? And so instead of saying I'm going to drink a bottle in that first hour, I'm going to drink a bottle and a half. So I'm going to be done with my first bottle in 40 minutes, right? Or I'm going to be done with my hand held by 40 minutes, for example, if I'm running so that I have to fuel it up again. So I get ahead of it. Just if anything, I, if I don't hit it, then I'm pretty close to what I wanted to do anyway, which is great. So set the bar a little higher. Maybe you make it, maybe you don't. But also it'd be a good data point for you moving forward. If I feel better after increasing that hydration, I can maybe even do better as well. Okay. That's another sort of important part of it. All right. Okay. So we talked a little bit about the pre stuff and the dehydration general state that you have. We talked about humidity and we talked about heat. But the last piece that I want to talk to you a little bit about is that bell curve I'm talking about, which is adaptation. How do you deal with the heat when you're actually training and racing? Inside a jurisdiction, when we move into the summer, that's the time we tell our athletes that when things start getting hard like that, it's time for us to switch our focus in zones from power and pace to heart rate. On race day, you'll use heart rate it is the number that captures all numbers and sums it up for us and gives it to you in a single one me easy metric to look at. And if you know your heart rate's in this window, whether you're biking, running or climbing or downhilling or whatever it is, you know, you're in a safe place, right? Anything at that number below, you're safe. Anything above that number, it's getting a little dangerous in here. Heat will increase that number as will bad choices, bad nutrition, illness, etc. All flags that should tell you like, ooh, something's just not quite right. And so one of the changes that we make for athletes at this point in time is having them focus on heart rate zones. For most athletes, they've got a good balance of data before. So they could go back and look and say, hey, I did a 15 mile run last weekend. My heart rate was X, now I'm running this weekend. Um, if I was thinking just about paces, I want to be the same pace or faster last weekend, but it's obviously much hotter now. So I can see that if I'm doing a 15 mile run, say again, my paces are 20 beats slower, sorry, 20, 20 seconds slower, but I'm running at the same beats that I ran at before. My body's doing the same amount of work cardiovascularly, and that's a net positive place for you. So the phases you move through are equalizing the heart rate to prior cooler efforts. So now we know one-to-one, -one, I did an hour and a half, two hours at the same heart rate. My body has done the same work. It'll feel slower. It may be slower, but your body's done that same level of work. Fast forward another seven days, you go back out for another same session because you don't like variety and you do the same thing all over again. This point in time, if you go back and you say, I'm going to run at that same heart rate again that I did in week one and week two, you're going to see that those paces will have come up a little bit. So instead of being a 20 second differential, it might be a 15 or 16 second differential. You've gained five seconds back. Best case scenario by that third weekend, you're about 10 seconds slower in the heat, which is fine. The lesson we're learning here is that we want to pace with heart rate. So we're using this challenge of the summertime as a tool to force us to learn how to use heart rate and use it effectively. We're also monitoring our performance over time from a heart rate perspective to understand just how much of our fitness has carried forth into the summer and how much of our fitness isn't there with that heart rate. You can always roll the dice at the end of a race, last half hour, if you want to push that heart rate, for example. But every time you exceed that heart rate number, you know that you're running into trouble because your body can't actually cool itself and continue to function doing the work you want to do. The stuff you could do in March and April and June was really nice. 
and a great time to schedule a race if you're a person who's particularly affected by the heat. But if you're dealing with it in the summer or early fall, like most of us will be, in that case, understanding what those heart rate zones are and parameters, these workouts are great sessions for that to get really dialed in on your happy place for heart rate. So use the data, take time, take the notes, figure it out, go back, take a look at it and say, this is actually where my happy place is with the heart rate. So you come away from dealing with this summertime heat, understanding about prehydration, understanding how you can manage the heat and just the direct sunlight for temperature, and also understanding some key strategies that you can use to go forward to manage your heart rate and make sure that you're giving your body for the room to adapt. You cannot continue to do the same thing that you've always done in different conditions and do it again in the heat. Sure, maybe for a 5K, but even that is going to be tough. Heat is insidious and really challenging. And the sooner you learn how to mitigate the cost through basic actions, once you've done those, we can start talking about what heat acclimation and heat preparation may look like for you. But step one is understanding what are the switches and levers that I need to twist and pull to make sure that I stay in that safe zone so I can continue to be awesome out there. Understanding that my competition will not all make the same choice, that I will be rewarded for my diligence and taking the time to do this work. Okay. So remember, summertime is an opportunity not just to go to the beach and show off your awesome body from all this training you've been doing, but also to simply get better at managing the metrics that matter and be better on race day when all things come equal and the medals are handled out, handed out, you'll be ready to go. All right. So be safe out there, put on sunscreen. Don't be like Coach P. And I'll talk to you guys soon. Have a great week.